Welcome to White Belt MMA. As you can see, we're not in our traditional stomping grounds. We're gonna to try to make one work here on the fly. Uh, I'm a little under the weather today, just because I had a little bit too much to drink last evening. And a toddler touched me with some uh, nasty boogers, so probably caught something from that Coincidentally, well. I'm dealing with the same thing, but I'm a week into my cold shower regimen and I'm feeling great. Oh, William Hoff, I really need to get on that because maybe I'll be- Wim. Wim Hoff? I yeah. it was William. I think it's just whim. Yeah, it might be short for William, I don't know. But he, there are also a number of people who are into cold showers, cold therapy, cryotherapy. He's not alone. Right. But well, yeah, uh, he definitely influenced me. Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to have to look into the, the literature on the cold showers. My, our boy Armando is three days in right now. Yeah. He likes it? He loves it. He okay. says it's too soon to tell. But right. he likes at least, if nothing else, that his showers are shorter more time to watch MMA That's because right. of how freaking busy uh, all the That's right. you know the scheduling that we have to watch and the whole litany of combat sports that we're going to get into today absolutely if we even have time to get into it um, obviously there was a UFC card this past weekend UFC Nashville there was also a Bellator card there was a uh, an LFA card there were so so many different cards and it's starting to get to a point where you need a lot of money to watch combat sports. If you really want to follow, if you don't want to be a casual, if you don't want to get ratioed on Instagram or Twitter and you know, get called out, you really got to be paying a lot of money. And I think that we're running into an issue now with Dazen or Dazone, sorry, um, jumping their price up to $20. It's, it's going to be really tough and you got to make some decisions, especially if you want to get the flow grappling and the flow wrestling. I don't know how you feel about it all. It's they're, really they're doubling the price, which is, you know, years ago when Netflix did this, I left Netflix. The only reason I still use it is because my mom has an account. You know, they were, they were trying to give you the same product for double the price. Now, arguably, DAZN is not giving the same product. At the time, Netflix was, but now Netflix has expanded their library. The Zone is not only expanding their their library with commentators like Robin Black doing a whole ton of stuff, and I, and I love his stuff. That's on the free content as well, like on YouTube and his Twitter and Instagram. He's I'm fun. liking and commenting yeah, on fun. almost everything. Yeah, it's fun. But they've also signed big name boxers as well. Canelo, GGG. Yeah, that's right. Triple G. So is it the people. same content if they're giving you all these big names? Like, are they're adding to the content, obviously, but it's all about value, right? Well, the way is, the thing to be considered is that the way that they cooked all these big names in the first place is by paying ridiculous amounts of money to these people. Right. Triple G is not making less than 10 mil on any of his fights. Yeah. I know boxers typically make more than MMA people, but that's a lot of guaranteed It's, it's definitely a little bit more than the usual, for so sure. So ESPN recently re-upped their deal, has the seven year contract now instead of a five year contract. All pay-per-views for UFC events have to go through them. We've seen all these in-depth interviews heading into the main event of the Nashville card. I was watching interviews they had with Pettis, interview they it's had great with content. Wonder Boy. It's great it's content. It's phenomenal. And it's $5 a month for just six, the normal package. Sure. $6, yeah. you know, there's a margin of error there. Of course, yeah. In any event, we also still have UFC Fight Library, which is nine ninety nine or oh Fight bucks. Pass, yeah, that's right. So Fight Pass still Although has Fight Pass gives you a ton of content though, like smaller yeah. promotion stuff. You know? Do you think? Yeah, it has the the left way. It has the Titan FC. It Iron has the Fights. EBI. Yeah, yeah. CJJ. It has a ton of stuff. Uh, totally the historic right. UFCs. Yep. Yep. I originally, when I first was getting back into MMA, because you know years ago back in 09 and stuff, I was into it, but I was more of a casual. This time I wanted to be historic, so I watched like all the beginning UFCs before I went into the to the it, recent stuff. It's it's great to watch like the rise, like an archetype of a fighter, like how they go from like their first fight to where they are. Then you like follow the path. You can go back and do that with any fighter you want, which is like phenomenal, yeah, you know? discipline when it's originally one discipline versus another discipline, and then people begin being multifaceted in their disciplines, even if they lean towards grappler or striker, they become multifaceted in training the stuff that otherwise you 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 know it'd be like a dogmatic religion where you don't see necessarily christians studying quranic texts and uh you know muslims studying the 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 rig beta <laughs> and jews studying you know uh, nietzsche or whatever right, no, it may be sure so it, it's nice to see the jujitsu people studying wrestling the wrestlers studying the muay thai the muay thai people focusing on traditional martial arts and boxing and all of that but between Fight Library and the ESPN app and the Zone and Flow, 
do you have any favorites or are there some things you like in one app that you wish another app would adopt or anything well, like that? Well, you almost have to get the, the ESPN Plus and Fight Pass just because for me, you always want to watch the best talent. And I think there's a reason why NBA is more popular than NCAA basketball, than European basketball. You want to watch the best guys because a lot of these guys are great in other promotions and they come to UFC and they're not great. And that, that could be a litany of reasons. It might not be the talent. It might not be like the actual fight that they get you know, booked into. But at the end of the day, the top talent is in the UFC and you want to watch the top talent. So for me, I have to take it. I have to watch that. Agreed. It's a point that we can elaborate on later in further detail, but when we get to the main event, Pettis versus Wonderboy, one of the most interesting things is that Showtime Pettis has had a pretty bad record before going into this fight. Something like three and six in his past nine. Always entertaining this. though. Always entertaining. Always entertaining. And the thing you have to realize is that he came in as a WEC champion, lightweight champion. And so he's fighting champions and contenders. I don't really think that WEC is as a separate promotion. I know that like, <laughs> it, they're just like, it, it's practically the UFC because the UFC just absol took all their champions, you know, and just like gave yeah. them the title. Like Jose Aldo was gifted the UFC title. He was the yeah. WEC featherweight champion. He didn't like fight for the UFC title. They were just like, you're a WEC champ. You're now the UFC champ. You know? I think Brent Akamoto from ESPN was saying that the fight he'd like to see next Sorry, looking ahead a little bit. It's Showtime Pettis versus Jose Aldo at 155, and fun. that would be his last fight before he retires. Would be fun. Although I, I we saw, I saw some rumors on our canal, which is I think like a Brazilian network, that Jose Aldo might be out of UFC 237 with some sort of infection. I, don't know. I hope not. Completely unsta unsta substantiated. Yeah. But uh, I, it could happen. You gotta pray that he starts taking cold showers right now. Oh man, stop! <laughs> this is this, we, we love spreading pseudoscience when we don't know if it's science yet. You know, we love that, but it's okay. Hey, it's well documented in sports. Yeah, it's no. just the extent of the benefits right. aren't as well documented, and they're slightly debated. But there have been rigorous scientific studies that cold therapy of various forms, ice baths, cryo, and cold showers have health benefits. I'm open to it. I think it's probably doing similar things that sauna is and just the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, just bringing inflammation down, which is just always the bad guy. Inflammation, inflammation is the bad guy. The number one room. killer. Wim Hof yeah. actually calls it one of the terrorists <laughs> along with <laughs> the PTSD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Especially awesome. when it causes depression, PTSD, right. suicidal thoughts, whatever it may be. No, when you get when you get fat, when you eat a lot, your body's building up inflammation. Like that's just like what's happening. Um, Affects your sleep, everything. Yeah. But so I think starting with UFC. You but but back to I wanted to just briefly touch the thing that we were talking about earlier with the prices of stuff. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. And I know that ESPN can keep it relatively low, and that's just because they can take the losses early before they have those subscribers before they reach a point where it's profitable. I'm sure it's profitable now, but they can take those losses because they're such an established brand, and. The zone is thinking that they gotta get the money now because they're paying out these contracts, they gotta get the money now. They're backed, I think it might be um, Vivendi or something. I think it's Len Botlinik, the Russian billionaire. So they have money, they have the big zone? money. Yeah, they have big money behind them. But their philosophy might be to be making money right away, whereas not taking losses. So I see the why the price is getting raised. I'm not happy about it, but I yeah. see the why. And I just don't know if I'm going to continue being a designer. I'm going to have to, in some way, watch the fights, but I don't know if I'm going to be a paying subscriber. <laughs> uh, wink, wink. Yes. Yeah. No, we're, we're paying. Yeah, not... um, but yeah, I did watch the, that Bellator card this past weekend. So oh, was it? it was low key. It was almost like I forgot that it was happening. Like I didn't. Like I had to like the day of. I was like, oh shit, there's a Bellator card, and I had to adjust my plans to fit it in. Um, it was Georgie. Karhanian, I think I'm saying that right. Um, and he, he trains out of uh, out of the garage. At OC. OC, yeah, at OC with TJ Dillashaw, Cub Swanson, all those guys. Aaron Pico, um, Archulera, the, the Spaniard. Um, so he's solid. And we actually watched Georgie at the High Rollers BJJ live in downtown, where he had a super fight against Jeff Glover, the pipe layer. The for, pipe layer for those Glover. of you who didn't know, the High Rollers event was the cannabis infused. Gi submission only BJJ somehow event. related to the Diaz brothers, which makes sense. Like they had some sort of connection there. Nick Nick was there signing stuff. Yeah. Eddie Bravo was there. Eve Edwards was there. Mickey Classic. Gall. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, but he was the main super fight on that, so I like I had recognition from him there, and obviously he's yeah. like, he's had a lot of fights. He's he like, lost that fight. Yeah, in yeah. The, in the gi, but he yeah, did lose. Of course. And Jeff Glover got an ounce of weed. Oh uh, yeah, that's a nice win. Um, but yeah, Georgie's had a really long career. He's been great. Um, he's more of a wrestling slash jujitsu base. He's not really a striker. Yeah. Um, but he's fun to watch. He's exciting. He always is going for trying to do work on the ground. Um, the guy he's fighting is a stud, Manuel Sanchez. So I was excited for that main event. Um, and it ended up kind of living up to potential. I don't know. Georgie kind of went for a lot of like just control on the ground. And I know Sanchez wasn't too happy about it. He basically said at the end of the fight that he didn't come to fight and that he really just came to hold him. And um, it was debatable who won, but I think Sanchez, I would say that the correct decision was made and Sanchez won the fight. But you could make arguments for Georgie. Yeah, and we don't have to repeat the ar arguments from last time about the merits of decisions. Right, I think the right. record will show yeah. what our opinions on that subject is. Um, and they had fought before, actually, and it was another kind of arguably one way or the other kind of fight. So those two will probably have a third fight eventually yeah, down the way. Right. Kind of like the Wonder Boy and Tyron Woodley fights. One right. win that's controversial, and then one draw that's controversial. Right. Right. And the Till Wonder Boy fight. Also. Woo! You know where I stand on that. That one boy won that fight, and it was in Liverpool, and they gave it to the hometown kid, in my opinion. But that's a whole different uh, story. Um, it was a kind of a weird fight for Sanchez because that's a perennial contender that was coming off a loss against the, the champion. He was like, he just fought for the title against Patricio. So it was like, what are you gonna do with Sanchez now? You don't want to drop him too far down. They didn't really have an opponent for him. Uh, Georgia was in another promotion in Russia. And he was actually signed to them, and then they had a big falling out. There was like a fight at, after his fight in his in his last fight because there was a late hit, and he severed ties with the promotion. Bellator signed it back. He used to sign for Bellator, so it was like a lucky situation for Bellator to get a fight for Sanchez that made sense. It was a rematch. Um, now that Sanchez won, I don't really know what they're gonna do with him. They might throw him in that featherweight tourney, which I'm super excited about for Bellator. If he's in there, who'd you like to see him fight first? I think they should start it with the winner of the um, Aaron McKee versus Pat Curran, which is going to happen next month. Um, Aaron McKee, if you don't know, is that rising prospect with uh, with Bellator at Featherweight. He's awesome, finishing guys in all sorts of ways. So I would love him to see the winner in that fight. And I think that might even be like the, one of the first fights of the tournament. It makes sense that that would uh, happen. Um, there was a, a couple other fights that were kind of interesting on the card. Uh, I know Gerald Harris versus Anatoly Tokov at middleweight was interesting to me because Tokov is a beast. He trends with Fedor um, and just has like a monster record. He's like 20 something and two. Similar style or no? That kind of judo base or no? Yeah, he's, Sambo, he's, judo? he's definitely like good everywhere. You know, he's not like the one thing over the other. But Gerald has had a lot of fights as well. And then he announced after the fight that he was retiring. So that was kind of like, you know, he's kind of gone quietly, but he's had a pretty nice career. Pretty, you know, and I was like, respect. props to him, man. Yeah, and he retired and. It, he had he almost won that fight. That's what was really interesting about it is that he had Anatoly rocked, and it was the first time I'd seen him rocked in Bellator. I'd watched three of his fights in Bellator. He looked pretty dominant in all three, and I thought if he won, you have to start thinking about him as a challenger for Musasi. If they ever figure out the Lovato situation for right. Musasi, but uh, Machida, maybe you give him Machida next. He had a big fight, you know, and or a cross promotion with Vitor. Yeah, so like uh, I was thinking, Anatoly's gonna be fine. He's gonna get through Gerald. Gerald's a veteran, but it's gonna be fine. He hurt him, and then I don't know why he did this, but he had hurt Anatoly, and then like instead of standing and trying to finish him, he like went to clinch and bring him down. Yeah. And that, there's always that argument where if you have a guy hurt, just like try to finish the fight. I don't know if he tried from a, dis from yeah, a distance, from a distance right? but like I don't know if he did try and do that. And Anatoly was the one that caused that to happen. I couldn't really see exactly what was happening, but yeah. it was kind of a strange move for me, and he ended up paying for it because Anatoly got the. And, you know, it, go, it goes to the point that I think has been made most prominently by Dana Hare, but a lot of people have made, it's that you can problem solve always, right? Chess is an analogy used for jiu-jitsu and fighting writ large. Sometimes people, Tyron Woodley on the ESPN cast was talking about two strikers in that way. As chess is used as an analogy a lot in fighting, but where it doesn't fit, where the analogy breaks down, is that in chess, you take turns. You wait for each other. In fighting, it's live. It's real time. It's the difference between a Final Fantasy type Square Enix game 
and the champions of Norath game. You, you throw real too time. many references on it. It's a difference between real time, a human being on the other end of the table, actively making decisions as you are countering your counters. You can make an argument though, turns. that it is turns, but it's moving at a much faster pace. Like there are turns happening, but it's so quick that you have to be up on but it. The reason I wouldn't call it that is because turns in the strict in the strict sense of it. In a loose sense, you could say that, but in a strict sense, like in chess, you cannot move until the other person is done. So it's not even a speed difference. Like your speed yeah. is zero. Your velocity should be zero when the other person's moving in chess. Yeah. Whereas in fighting, the velocity it could be anything. You can pause if you want and have a velocity of zero to watch and observe, or you could go faster or slower than them. No, I, I think you're making an interesting point there. Um, I, 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 All that to say, you don't know, like, if the other guy wasn't moving, maybe he'd be good, but maybe his poor decision making, if that's what it was. Right. We don't know. I don't know. It's due to that. Gerald could have been making a smart move, something he noticed, and he thought that he can get a clinch work and get it done, but it, I don't know exactly. I can't, I'm biting his head. Uh, maybe I would have done it differently. I don't know. Um, but overall, um, Team Fedor had a great night in Bellator. Uh, they had another guy, a big prospect, um, Moldovsky, I believe his name was Moldovsky. Another guy who is kind of a small heavyweight, you know, like the 220, 225, uh, 6'1", like very similar build to Fedor. I think he could have easily been a light heavyweight, but doesn't want to do the cut. Um, not, not everyone would take that as a compliment. No, no, no. <laughs> but this, it really adds a significant speed difference, like versus anybody else. And he was fighting a guy who was coming up from light heavy to heavyweight, Linton Vassal, a veteran from England. And Vassal was huge. I, I didn't understand this guy made 205. He was like 250, so 6'4", 6'5". He's a monster guy. I'm like, I don't know how the hell you ever made 205. And he said he's done with 205. So stay out of way. He really liked not. John sure. Jones, similar height, makes 205. They say even easier now. Some people say yeah, but I don't without think, PEDs, I don't think easier. John Jones is even close to 250. Maybe 235, but 250 is like... On, on this point. card, it, on the UFC card, sorry, jumping ahead, yeah. we had violent Bob Ross... Oh man, I forgot three. all about that. Yeah, let's, yeah, we can just transition now if you want. I was like, pretty we much, can't. Yeah. I just the quick point I wanted to make. I wasn't super impressed by that fight, but the quick point I wanted to make was that he's six foot three, already looking skinny or at something. He may skinny at one fifty five, and he cut for one forty five, and he missed it actually. by a lot. I mean, by a lot. Like usually they miss by like a half pound, but like yeah, two, two three pounds, pounds is like you know. Three. Well, 146 is the limit. 146 yeah. is a maximum you're not supposed to be, but the the, the weight class is called 145. I know, I know. but so, I'm just saying how, how it would be considered. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not, 146 is not championship weight. That's only regular belt Absolutely, weight. you can't win the title so, on that weight. You can only so, be a regular fight. Correct. So three pounds over championship weight at the weigh-in, in, in, in the ring, God knows how much you The weigh. thing is, though, like that's always, like people think that's an advantage in a fight when you weigh more than the other guy. But it's usually a sign that you didn't have a great weight cut. Yeah. And when you don't have a great weight cut, you're not feeling great. You're feeling like I am today. You're feeling kind of like under the weather. You're feeling like your body is like out of whack. And then you got to go into a fight. So yeah. it's like, it's a struggle to figure out. Obviously, he got down and it was difficult. But I don't know. I think he should go back to 155. I don't think he should do that again. I hope they don't let him. You know, I don't want to say don't let him because he's trying to pursue an opportunity to make money and I get that I'm all about people getting their paper you know getting their bread but I think that it would be better if he was a 155 so do you, do you want to jump back to anything we missed on Bellator no Otherwise, no no I think it was I think it's fine because um, there's a lot I could say about this one and it didn't end in a finish no no no, no. and I I was, I was just going to continue on with this and just okay. mention how much respect I have for uh, Steven Peterson. I would show Peterson. Yes. Fortis MMA. They fucking produce great guys. You, you I called keep, it. You, I keep you did. On this. You did. And that Dallas Fort Worth area. He took a ton of shots. And I don't know. Okay, maybe that's not good. Maybe he should be not defending and not making sure he didn't get hit. But he was tough and he was not going to get finished. And there, he was like transitioning on a lot of those ground positions really well. He was like getting, he was like switching up on Luis a lot and getting top control a lot. And I thought. It was a fun fight because it wasn't one style. You saw everything from both guys. It was really yeah. all around. Um, I would have liked there to be a finish, but it was a fun fight. I enjoyed it. So, Louis Violent Bob Ross Pena was lighting. That's why I said Violent Don't forget Bob the violence, yeah. <laughs> Was lighting up Peterson. Yeah. At, at range. At, 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 at range. 
and Peterson wasn't having it, so he'd repeatedly take him down, not realizing that this is a an AKA guy who's really good at not just wrestling, but jujitsu. An interesting thing that DC kept pointing out, interesting to have DC, the coach. He got took down of two AKA. or three times. But yeah, Steven. so he was so he was commenting throughout the fight that instead of doing a normal takedown defense, what Violent Bob Ross likes to do is threaten with submissions. Yeah. So he would threaten with Kimuras, he would threaten with a back tank. Off the cage, yeah. Off everything. Cage, yeah. He just is always threatening submissions. So rather than just trying to prevent the takedown, he's trying to get well, submissions. Well I think that's part of the reason part of the reason why he gets taken down. He's not using the technical wrestling to stop your opponent from getting legs. He's going for an attack rather than defending. And it's a it's a diff, it's an interesting strategical maneuver yeah. that he did. Weirdly enough though, Peterson got his back like got Pena's back like two or three times and just wasn't able to finish. Each time Pena was able to flip around and and yeah. get out of the situation. I, and, and I mean uh, while they're standing, yeah. while they're on the ground, it was it was a lot of threat and escape, threat and escape and there were no deep submissions. No, I agree. I agree. Um, although I think Steven was a lot of times he was rocked and he just did a good job of not showing it. He did a very good job of stealing himself. You know? Call it chin, call it stamina, yeah, yeah. call it heart. No, but it's not sometimes he had chin. It. Sometimes guys have chin and like you can't tell that they're hurt. And like it, maybe they're not even hurt. Maybe they, they really yeah. just wear it. But Steven looked like he was hurt, but he was like staying. Oh, there were a couple times that Pena was going in for the kill, trying to finish him off, and then he realized I got to back off a little bit. Yeah. And he like, received something on the way in. Yeah. yeah. He caught him with nasty elbows, like yeah. you said. DC was criticizing not enough leg kicks and there weren't a lot of low like thigh tie to be honest leg kicks but he hit him in the head a couple times to be honest i, I don't know like how comfortable luis would have been because he's kicking a smaller guy so it's, it's kind of hard to hit the spots like the calf kick is hard to do against steven when you're luis yeah he, head kick sure body kick yeah but like the, the classic calf kick the low kick is harder to do and to be honest i'd have to look at the the control that each of them had but a lot of time was spent in the clinch a lot of time was ground cage I, I fucking getting love in that a move, shit, get out of I it i love clinch work i think that like it's a lot of favorite. people think it's boring but like it's it's great techniques i would live in it i live in it yeah. it's in you know we are also basketball fans like ariel helwani is who's begun commentating yeah. right for the nba yeah. i would equip it i would say it's the equivalent of people who appreciate not just offensive but defensive post work yeah a lot of a lot of people underappreciate the sort of rebounding blocking and then just stopping of shots without blocking that especially because the, the league now is a shooting league it's a lot of that stuff is kind of disappearing very very work. Yeah. very theatrical minded so the three-point shot is probably the equivalent to the knockout punch or the spinning elbow it's, it's equivalent to stand up i think it's yeah. like striking versus grappling. Uh, so I think that's enough on my end on this fight. The one thing I'll say is the most amazing revelation, and this is something we had talked about before, I believe on the podcast, if not for sure off the podcast. For me, one of the most exciting prospects in the light heavyweight and middleweight divisions, I say this because he's fought at both. He claimed to be 5'7 on paper, but he's really 5'5. They announced that Darren Wynn has now been signed to the UFC. And, and that was a while ago. Yeah, but this, yeah. but they re-announced it here on live in the broadcast, oh, yeah. and they mentioned it because him and Pena live together. They've done interviews on Ariel. Imagine Lohan's Pena show is together. six inches taller than that guy, and so many weight divi- and he's in like, one forty-five. Like weight divisions below. One, he's six inches taller or yeah. more, and he's almost a foot taller. Yeah, Let's yeah, say yeah, roughly yeah. a foot taller. No, that's like. Just say roughly a foot tall. It sounds nice. And and he's like five divisions less. Yeah, that's crazy. It's absolutely insane. But honestly, he's a guy who walks around at 5'5 five, five or 5'6, five, 225. I'd love to see him fight heavyweight one day, but let him start off as a middleweight as Chael Sonnen did. And then when he's comfortable, he could fight at light heavy and heavy, depending on or what matchups Or when he can't do the cut are. anymore. That's usually what Or when he can't do the cut. Yeah, yeah, as he grows older, yeah. he may not have the discipline, but but he trained at the Olympic Center, yeah. like Kamaru Usman, like Ben Askren, like Henry Cejudo, oh, wow. like Daniel Cormier. You just so, ball, man. Yeah, th- those are all top contenders and, and champions. So. He's got a, a, a great regimen, and I'm actually more excited about his entering the UFC than I am about Violent Bob Ross. 
but the personality, the afro, the beard, the swag, makes me still want to keep watching Luis right. Payton. No, I think, I think that's fair. Whatever he fights at. Right. I, I hope it's not a lot of So there Maybe was, even welterweight. But speaking yeah. of the clinch work stuff that you've been yeah. talking about, that was how uh, Macy really turned the tide in her fight. And I think that was a fight I was super excited for. Uh, I know we're skipping a little bit ahead. Of the no, 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 go ahead. We jump around. We'll jump around. Yeah, we might head back to the There's main. another girls' fight I want to talk about, too, so go right. ahead. Right, um, but this was, I think, on the main card, the yeah. first fight. Um, and Macy Barber was originally a straw weight, I believe, and then she was moving up in this one for to, to uh, fly weight because she was having trouble with the cut to straw weight. And she said she even had trouble. She had trouble with the cut to fly weight. It's like, whoa, you're fighting that strawweight? Yeah, because they walk around at like 145, bro. Yeah. They say they're strawweight, but they're 145, 135. It's not healthy, uh, man. Abolish weight classes. Yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> we can you finish. A hard about all, the, all that, for sure. <laughs> um, and I thought that they were, you know, just setting her up with like a relatively easy fight with flyweight. I didn't really do that much study work or tape work on J.J. Aldridge, but I was shocked at like, how good J.J. Aldridge was in space. And first round... I, it was demolished. Uh, Macy was getting demolished. It was like she's super young. I know she's twenty. I keep thinking about that. I'm like super Man, young. Like you can tell all you want about how she needs to be coached or how she should be listening to her coaches. Yeah. I mean, when you're twenty years old, like I can't even remember what I was doing. People were hating on Till for being young for his two recent knockout losses, and he's twenty four. Yeah. Well, some people said 26. Okay, 20, I don't know his real age. No, I've heard 24 and 26. 24. She's 20. I can make 24. You have an argument for being well versed at that point, especially if you've got 20 yeah. MMA fights. Uh, Macy is like 20, and I believe the youngest active roster member of the UFC. If she beats Shevchenko, she'll be the youngest champ, I think. Well, she's the youngest, period. In yeah. Time <laughs> right now. And forget the champ. Yeah. Um, and she just did not know how to handle her. She wasn't as clean technically as JJ. Every time she went in or tried to get close to JJ, she got pieced up, and then she didn't have good technique at backing out. Like, JJ was phenomenal at doing a cup, two or three piece and getting out very clean. In and out, so clean on every strike, and Macy, it was like the classic difference between strength versus technique. Macy was significantly stronger. And, and not just generic technique, but this the point style fighting, getting in and out, so people but, don't get used to the combos. Right, but it wasn't just point style. She was taking her out. She two knockdowns. Yeah. She knocked Macy down twice because Macy kept falling backwards. Every time she got hit, she didn't try to strafe out of the way of a strike. When you fall backwards and you're getting hit, it's very easy for someone to just continue forward and continue yeah. to hit you. So when you're going like this, that's not helpful to your situation at all. So Macy was having problems. I was like, oh my gosh, she's gonna probably lose in this next round and it's over. And then she changed up her style. She was way more aggressive in the second round. Started grabbing onto JJ when she could, when she got close enough. Elbowing in clinch, getting shots in. And then the one thing JJ wasn't doing at all, she only threw jabs and crosses and she didn't throw hooks. And Macy practically exclusively threw hooks. So she was elbow, elbow, and then a few hooks. She relented, went back up against the cage, and it was over. Macy won the fight in the second round. But if you had told me after the first round that Macy was going to win by finish in the second round, I would have laughed at you because of how it was going in the first round. So it was really interesting to see her adjust. Hopefully she took that coaching and she really went after it. And that could be a theme writ large for the card, and we'll talk about that for the main yeah. event. But while you're on the subject of, of grappling women, you had Hill and Marcos. Hill, interesting, being the first black American UFC fighter, as she says in her Twitter bio, versus Marcos. Hill, the classic striker, had said that she had trained her grappling a lot in preparation for this fight. Marcos, the classic grappler, straight up said she spent all her time in a Muay Thai gym this time around. Mm. And when you see them fight in the beginning, they exchange with striking, striking, striking. But what is a classic part of Muay Thai that we're just talking about? Clinch. The clinch. Yeah. So as soon as they got into clinch, Marcos goes back to grappling mode, gives her a hip toss, and that's gonna be pretty much all she wrote because they continue grappling from side control and eventually she gets an arm bar. Hill was fights for her dear life. Sweet arm Hill was fighting for her dear life, but it wasn't a technical escape. The escape was just, let me hold on for dear life and eventually you're gonna have to let go of that grip 
eventually she did after some adjustments and it was a beautiful submission jujitsu so you got to see the stand-up wrestling takedown with a nice jujitsu finish the judo it was like muay thai judo yeah juji gatami yeah which is a cross pinning i took a actually a dana hair seminar on arm bars and one of the things he said linguistically or etymologically is that in Japanese, the jujigatami or the arm bar, it's not just an arm bar. The translation is that it's like an arm hold or a perpendicular hold. Right. And so the idea is you can finish from the position if you want, right. but if you watch Marcos, before she finishes, this is an MMA she match. It. She adjusted, not just adjusting it with, with the grappling, she adjusted it with striking. So it's also similar to Dean Thomas, the coach of Tyron Woodley, the jujitsu coach from ATT, who says that the jiu-jitsu he teaches online is jiu-jitsu with strikes, which goes to the CJJ or the combat jiu-jitsu I love. She's holding the armbar, and as Hale is stubbornly uh, holding not, on, not on. holding on for dear life, Marco says, okay, you're gonna hold on with two hands? There's nothing protecting your face. Thwack to the face, thwack to the face. So then she has to protect Very the face. Very technical terms, thwacks. thwacks. Very, I love <laughs> onomatopoeia. And so then when she goes to protect her face from the thwacks, that's when she pulls on the the jujigatami or the arm bar or the, the arm hold. And so you see it's not just a pure submission, but it's a hold because she can't get out of it. So it's it's the same thing as a pin in NCAA wrestling or in pro wrestling. It's a way of holding someone in a place that they don't want to be. And the idea is to control them. And only when you know you have control via the strikes and the grappling, that's when you go for this finish or the submission. Right. No, I think that was... That was a fun one, and that was a great little finish. It was a great little arm bar. And um, Thug Nasty, Mitchell versus Moffat, anything you want to say about about those boys? Um, That was a great fight. I think it won fight of the night, if I look back at the bonuses. Uh, probably deserved. It was an interesting fight. I love the Wolfman. I love Bryce Moffat. Uh, he trains out of the MMA lab with all those boys down there. Um, and he's just good everywhere. Is that New Mexico or Arizona? Arizona. 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 Yeah, it's Sugar and... Uh, Campino and all those guys and Benson yeah. Henderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, um, one of the people Pettis beat early on. Right, right. Off twice. The, off the cage, yeah, twice. kick in the face. In WEC slash UFC. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Bryce is fantastic jiu jitsu. Really good. And he had that, his last fight against Chaz Kelly had that controversial finish where it was an Anaconda choke and the ref thought Chaz went out. Chaz didn't go out. Chaz even thought about appealing uh, it. I don't know where that went, but I thought. Uh, Bobby was great, and I thought a tough matchup for him with Bryce. I think Bryce is undefeated, both good everywhere, both good jujitsu. I was like really interested to see how where would go, and um, I, I think what did you did you think that that was the correct call? I think it was, and for me the most impressive thing was that there was a very tight darts that Moffat had early on. He loves darts and anaconda. Uh, that's like his move. In fact, in the post, uh, in like the post post fight interview, mm -hmm. Mitchell was talking with the, the crew upstairs and he was saying that he was training all camp waiting for the darts. And he said, this guy's not gonna darts me. And then he found himself in the darts. Well, that's and then, smart that he was training for the darts because that's what Bryce goes to every time. 100%. Just like RDA was training with Edwin Najimi that right. we talked about in right. preparation of the Tony for Ferguson Tony, fight. Yeah. So he's training his whole camp waiting for the darts. He thought it wasn't going to come because he thought it would be too obvious. Sometimes the most obvious thing is what's going to happen. Yeah. He gets in there. He said he thought about tapping multiple times, but thinking about his mom who doesn't even watch him fight, who doesn't support him fighting, but the way that she raised him in Arkansas, which was a big theme in his post-fight interview, the first one, he said that helped him through, and he fought through, he found a way out, and then continued, and he didn't just survive, right? right. This wasn't like last time when we were talking about Leon Edwards holding on for dear life, or Hill holding on for right. dear life. This was an, a man actively trying to win after almost being finished, and and it really makes you lightheaded when you get in a darts. Of course, it, it makes you. If you don't know, you should go to choke. a jujitsu class and see how you feel after getting darts. Let someone darts you. Yeah, and see how you feel. Yeah, and then imagine trying to come back. So thinking about the willpower and the technique that it that usually it takes to come if back. It's pretty tight. I respect that. Usually, if it's pretty tight, and I'm in a guillotine anaconda darts of some kind, and I'm in it for a long period of time. I usually have a hard time getting my bearings afterward, like having to sit down, need a glass of water, yeah. let alone thinking about having to fight. <laughs> you know, it's a different thing. It takes a lot of heart, and I'm going to give you another great reference. 
I, I grew up listening to a lot of different underground hip hop, as you know, and the fans will get to know over the time of this podcast. So if y'all know XZ, he's a rapper out of Wichita, Kansas. And one of the big things that he imprinted in me was that even though I'm from LA and I grew up in LA, he's from Wichita, Kansas. Everyone said he had to leave Wichita if he wanted to make it big. Yeah. He made it big and he, XV still out there XV still out there making, making music. it big is, is, is he's making a living for himself he's right, not no, he's not Drake right. but he's right. he's living on his own terms Agreed. and he's supporting his family and he didn't have to leave Wichita that's great Bryce made the same point he said he trained down with Jocko Willink and Dean Lister and Victory MMA in San Diego wow. he went all over to many different camps but everyone kept trying to recruit him and said you're not gonna make it in MMA unless you leave but every time he goes back to his home camp in Arkansas and we've seen that, as you said, he's been an undefeated fighter. He's come back from crazy, crazy right. dar strokes and and other fights that seem uh, he the guy that had a very the, impressive the, the nut accident. He is. Yeah. He had the power tool accident, and they had memes of him with a coon hat. Ooh. That's not a racial surf for blacks, but a raccoon hat and a power tool oh, after his victory. Man. So they were hilarious memes. Oh, okay. So to come back from that is another great thing. He said going forward, he wants to take a lot of time off and train and heal. So he's not going to rush back into his next fight. So I'd say he's a great prospect to look out for. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think that actually that fight was a lot closer than people think up until the third round. I think the third round is really when Bryce kind of pulled it away. And I think that you could have made some arguments for Moffitt, but it's probably fair at the end of the day. Yeah, especially by threatening a submission. Yeah. No, of course, he had him in trouble. And you have to really factor that in. Yeah. Um, but which makes his escape that much greater. Because the greater the trouble, the greater the escape is. Whatever value you attribute to it, the escape is that much greater. And the ability to fight on, going to, relating it to boxing, it's like, yeah, Deontay Wilder knocks down Tyson Fury twice, but Tyson Fury gets up and wins the round. And that's what's impressive. Sure. Although... I don't want to get too into that, but there's the whole things about whether the time was up before he got up. Yeah, yeah, you know, the simplest thing about that is that it's not, there's no objective rule. And we've talked about, you know, when we refer to the the whole MMA or combat sports industrial complex of experts as quacks, one of the issues is the uniformity is not going to be there because it's going to be contextual. and. And there's always this debate in every field, not just combat sports, but in every field about the value of as you grow as an organization between standardization and then having case by case. In religious settings, it's the great value or idea, or even in, in political debates, of justice versus mercy. And in this context, that referee is the one who has the discretion about the count, and the way he was counting it out is what goes not what people do with their timers outside of it. You could then maybe sense, censure him. Could you make an argument for automation at a certain point? You, you can have the robots replace us, and maybe they're better, but maybe no, there's I'm a just, human I'm playing element. devil's advocate. Yeah, I'm not really yeah the devil definitely yeah. needs a lawyer, but you know what? I think there's always going to be a human component, whether it's creativity, whether you, you know, make up a platonic idea of the soul, whatever it is, I think there's always going to be something missing with AI, but I'm definitely open to the idea. Sure. I'm not a Luddite, so I do believe that we use technology, and if we use it right, it can help us and benefit us. Absolutely. The Let's go to the Coleman event and the main event. I think so. I think that's a good move. Blades um, versus Justin Big Pretty Willis? Yeah, from, you know, it's really hard to imagine because... Big pretty cuts weight to get to 265, right? which is yeah. insane. Yeah, he like it. and a, another reason for the absolute division that I always request: open yeah. weights. The you only know, weight. I love that idea just because Juan Adams, the Kraken. I want him to come in at 300 and nobody gets versus Big Pretty at 300. <laughs> triple threat match. Throw Derek Lewis yeah. in there and Ngannou. Yeah, but so Final to four. imagine a 266 two guy. We don't know how much he is in the ring, and Curtis is tossing him around. Curtis, though. Not not the lightest man in the, in the oh, heavyweight Curtis division. Maybe, maybe he's two six. Okay. He weighed in at two sixty two. Sure, but he's grabbing another guy that weighs probably more. Correct. And throwing Correct. him around. Remember the leverage too. Big pretty is shorter, 
Curtis is taller. It's tougher to go grab. About four inches. Go grab Justin. And there's a couple throws that they weren't just like single leg or double leg takedowns. They were like he was lifting oh, yeah. him off the ground. He he slammed him, I want to say, about three or five times. I actually tweeted it. <laughs> so if you look through UFC Nashville hashtag, you'll probably see my tweets live during the event. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was about three to five slams. Two of them were soft. Yeah. Interesting enough, he he broke the UFC heavyweight record for takedowns in that match right. which was previously held by another great wrestler in that division Cain Velasquez wow I, mean, I don't think I caught that stat yeah it's uh, an amazing stat but but some of them were forceful some of them were light right all of them were controlling I love to see Curtis versus Cain next if Cain fights again you read my man yeah. you read my mind yeah. maybe I I I, I uh, prompted you with yeah, that no, stat. I, I, was like, I was thinking trying to figure out like who would he fight next. So he like, called out JDS, Derek Lewis, and Stipe. Stipe would be his, his favorite because that would give him a title contention if he wins that after. I think, yeah, sure. I don't know if Stipe will take any fight for the title right now. It's true. Uh, and I think JDS, the only fights that really make sense for JDS are either uh, a title fight at some point against Cormier or, or uh, running it against Ngannou for number one contender. And then you could maybe even do uh, JDS Stipe 3 because yeah. they had two fights already and they both went in opposite directions. So you can make those three cases for him. You can make any of the fights. I would like to see that, the the Blades versus Stipe, just because Stipe has been the the least active of all the people we, we named. Because he's offended at the situation, obviously. And Derek Lewis pulled out of the fight they were supposed to have in January. Right. But yeah, simply in, in conclusion, the co-main event, were three rounds of utter domination. Right. Big Pretty trains at a place of wrestling. Do you think Curtis should have wrestling. tried to finish more? You know what he did, and he talked about that again with uh, Tyron Woodley, and um, I'm forgetting her name, but the other host in the post post fight interview. He said that there was one moment in the third round where he was going to let Big Pretty up so that he could try to finish him from striking more, and then he realized that it was too risky, so he continued his strategy of double leg, single leg, stand-up clinch. I can see that down. because of what and happened to him again with Ngannou. I can see that. Habib style, yeah. wrist control, right. pound, pound, Legs, pound. Yeah. I would answer your question by saying I think he could have tried to finish more, but the way he would have tried to finish more that would have been safer, and, and this belies my, my bias as well, but it's my bias because it's effective, submission grapple. Right. He, had, he had him in several times with one or two hooks in and wrist control and he chose to ground and pound which got him points and gave damage to Willis versus and also embarrassed versus going for the lion killer or the rear naked or going for an arm bar or I mean you could go anything Dars headlock yeah, there's so many submission grappling moves that are available to you you, you can you can do uh, what's the Eddie Bravo move it's like the, the the crotch ripper where you have the leg split. Oh, banana split? Yeah, the banana split. Yeah. He, could, he could have done that move too. I think I think that, you know, it goes back to what you're saying about him being safe and I think that's really what it, he was nervous about another Ngannou situation where he felt like he got screwed and it was like a second. And I don't even think Willis has the power of an Ngannou but just to take that option off the table and especially there were moments where Willis was talking about Curtis Blade's mom. Like it, it reminds you of some of the shit talking gone wrong. It reminds you of people getting strikers, getting manhandled by a wrestler. But what makes this worse is Willis ahead of time was saying that his wrestling was better. And he's hanging around with Darren Wynn. He's hanging around with DC. See, so you almost want to make believe this him. point. I was going to make this point when you were talking about Pena being at AKA. Just because you're at a gym that specializes in one thing doesn't immediately make you good at that. Agreed. Point. Agreed. It, but if you're talking shit that you are good yeah, about it, <laughs> then you better back that shit up. Right. But in this event, actually, in Adamic fashion, Curtis Blades renamed Big Pretty Big Titty. Oh, wow. And That's he was, accurate. He was, talk <laughs> <laughs> he was talking mad shit. Uh, but he saved his shit talking till the end after he showed it with his work. Right. And I appreciate that. Sure. And, you know, it's funny. It's like the complete opposite with the main event. You know, it was like completely, it was like a finish. All respect. Yeah. Before and after. Yeah. No, no shit talking beforehand. Yeah. Not even the little bit that you saw with Woodley versus Usman. They just have respect. I think Pettis was all respect. Yeah. These are two traditional martial artists, mm -hmm. Taekwondo and Karate. Robin Black made the point that there's very little distinction between them. I'll make the distinction as a man who studied Taekwondo for five and a half years and as a 
I, don't know, I think the distinction is that Pettis, Tony, you. Pettis will choose to engage more than Thompson does. Thompson is a much safer fighter. Where Pettis oh, no, no, I just meant generically in the arts, not even them as individuals. Oh, oh okay. Uh, Black was saying that they're the same thing. Karate is a little bit more punch-oriented. Yeah. Both do punches and kicks. Taekwondo is almost zero punches. Yeah, I remember speaking from your experience in Taekwondo. Yes, I remember fighting in a Taekwondo tournament, and I, I landed about 20 punches on somebody, mm -hmm. and it was zero points. Right. It, it was psychologically damaged them, and I won the <laughs> fight later with kicks, but they gave me zero points. Right, and no. my coach was yelling at me, like, stop, stop punching, punching him. him. <laughs> and, and I was like, no, 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 there's psychological damage, <laughs> you know. You, you grow up seeing Mike Tyson say he'll eat your children. You know that psychological warfare is a part of fighting. Right. Jocko Willink talks about it a lot as well. In fact, he has a psychological warfare field manual. Yeah. But in, in any event, this fight was absolutely amazing. Both of them have the traditional martial arts Who would you say won the first round? Karate. I know that the, the fight finished in the second, but who did you say won the first round? Well, it, it finished at 4.55 in the second round. That's five seconds left. Right. Almost as amazing as the Yair finish of the Korean Zombie, which finished in like the last half second. I would say Thompson was winning both rounds. Really? And I, all up to the last point, Thompson is winning both rounds. And so like exactly Zombie thing. versus uh, Yair? Yeah, but even more so. Wow, I thought Zombie even was more really so. dominating Yair, man. Even more, and I watched yeah. that fight too. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because they had totally different strategies. Right. Like you said, Thompson likes to be evasive. The Wonder Boy. He's hard to figure out. He's hard to figure out. He's very hard to figure out. He has his hands down. He has a karate, sideway, sideways stance. stance. Yeah. He uses the underutilized sidekick. And actually, that sidekick was his demise. I'm going to give you another superhero reference because there was a Superman oh, punch used. On a Wonder Boy. <laughs> Everyone in the DC universe right. argues about Batman versus Superman. For me, if Batman and Superman didn't know anything about each other and they randomly stumble upon each other, Superman is winning that every time. Seven days a week and twice on ten out of ten times. A, a thousand times. Yeah. However, if you give them time to prepare, Batman is going to win nine times out of ten, if not okay. ten I'm times out of ten. Still waiting for the analogy. That you're so the analogy Pettis here, Batman. The analogy here <laughs> is that. Pettis is Batman, even though he I'm uses out. the Superman I'm gonna punch. Once again, leave so, because I disagree. So check with this out. <laughs> check this out. Wonder Boy has already lost to this camp twice yeah. with Tyron Woodley. If Ben Askren, who was coaching him, who's also in this division, I also commented this on Twitter, but now Duke Rufus has potentially three people in the top ten in welterweight in the UFC. See, phenomenal. I didn't, I didn't want to get into that, but I'm, what I was I was going to ask this later is. What do you see? Who do you see them fighting next? I'll, I'll get to that, but let me yeah. finish the analogy to make sure that it hits. Okay. So, because Duke Rufus as a coach has had all this time to prepare, and even though Ben Askren was involved with the NCAA wrestling, you know he was talking to Pettis. Yeah. And even though Tyron Woodley is commenting, and he even commented with, uh, with Wonder Boy next to him, which shows the respect that they could have even after the wars and controversial wars they've had, right. you know he talked to Pettis. All the preparation that Pettis has had and the losses, the kind of shaky record he's been coming off of, Pettis is Batman because he's had all of this time to prepare and game plan. And even with that game plan, you don't have a guarantee. So his game plan going into it is use the traditional Taekwondo he has. There's a moment in the first round where he does this flying wheel kick and Wonder Boy dodges it and he falls on his ass. And after, instead of trying to like jump on him and ground and pound, he lets them get up and they dap each other. And he gives them respect for the attempt. Yeah. That's almost too much and respect. respect. That's too much. Well, it's like the Anderson yeah. Silva versus Israel fight that, that, that happened the, recently. That was a no, part, partially annoying as well. Yeah. yeah. But interesting about both of those fights is that even though it's MMA rule set, the, no one had even one attempt of a takedown. Yeah. Not even a single attempt of takedown. I thought Anthony Pettis might because I honestly thought Wonder Boy is a better striker and he's bigger. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, Wonder Boy was winning on punches. He starts from, like we said, hands down, and he, he's just way faster than Pettis. And he was landing way more than punches. He was landing more kicks, but Wonder Boy's kicks were to the head, to the body, to the legs, and Pettis's were almost exclusively to the legs, which you could say is tiring him out or making him at least rethink 
the strategy of doing any leg kicks to Pettis. So Wonder Boy's winning for two rounds, and at 455, this is a point that people were missing in the Twitter sphere. People originally thought that Pettis jumped off the cage. One, because he became Showtime Pettis when he did it to Ben Henderson. Well, he did, but not with his feet. He did what I call a booty bump maneuver. So Wonder Boy comes in, and I'll demonstrate this for the YouTube audience. I don't think they can see sitting how, down. how much light we lost, but, go ahead. <laughs> but they'll see. Yeah. Wonder Boy comes in with that underutilized sidekick that everyone does. Yeah. And instead, of, there are many ways you could respond to this. It, yeah. I know, I saw many it. ways you could respond. You could go into it. In physics, they would say if you go into it, you get a w rid of the acceleration yeah. and the velocity, right? Yeah. Or you could try to dodge it left or right, or you could try to dodge it back. Pettis does none of those things. He absorbs the full force of the sidekick mm -hmm. and lets it take its natural momentum, throws him into the cage. From the cage, he uses his booty and his, his lower back strength, so like whatever squatting or endurance exercises he does, his lower body and back strength. This is very scientific. To, to bounce off of the cage. Mm -hmm. And from there, he does the Superman punch everyone says, mm -hmm. and he changes it up by doing a slight, a very slight, not a, uh, uh, not like an obtuse hook. hook. Yeah, not an hook. obtuse hook, not a clean hook, but a, a hybrid hook and back right hand punch using the momentum of the sidekick from it Wonder Boy. And he hits him precisely on the chin. And it was over when he hit it with that. He didn't need any follow up, I think. He had, I think, two more punches like, from the really ground and Herb came in and pulled him yeah, away. He was out. Similar to punch. Jorge getting the two extra punches on Till yeah. after the two weeks in a row of, of of great, uh, and you could throw this as another crazy stat or not, great Hispanic 55ers who move up to 170 to fight against the bigger striker that you thought was well, going to win. Well, let's finish with pretty much this. Let's say that maybe Masvidal Pettis is an interesting fight at 170 if they're not At 170 or 155, they're down uh, for either. I think uh, Pettis, I don't know how long he is for 170. He probably might go back down to 155. I think he was just going up to 170 because it was an interesting fight. I think Pettis is at the point in his career where he's going to take interesting fights. Agreed. He's, he's not really in title contention for stuff. But right? nothing at 45, he says. Yeah. So I can see the Aldo at 155 happening. I can see interesting big name fights for him. And for Wonder Boy, I don't know where you go with him. He's going to have a, a tough uh, a find for an opponent at 170. It's going to be interesting. I think there's still a lot of people in the top 10. Ponzinibbio could be a great opponent for him. I don't think Ponzini was going to take anybody outside of the top five because yeah. he's very entitled with his seven uh, straight wins. There's a lot of great fights coming happening at 170 with Dos Anjos and Kevin Lee moving up to meet him there. So there's Correct. a lot of interesting fights. That's like one of my big fights I'm looking forward to is Dos Anjos. Versus yeah, Lee. and he was saying something recently about how he's just kind of taking orders from UFC because people were complaining about the matchups that he's been having. Oh man, wrestler after wrestler after wrestler after wrestler. Corey <laughs> Dos Anjos is taking these monsters. But at least Kevin Lee is probably more his size. I don't know, the other guys yeah. he was fighting, Usman, way bigger than Both Dos candidates, yeah. I think, as we mentioned before, for that 65 division. Absolutely. Would love a tournament with them in it. Why don't yeah. you do that, Dana? Ben Please. Askren and Khabib, I yeah. think, have played with the idea as well, as well as GSP so, and Farhas' camp. Yeah, and uh, I think before we lose too much light here, uh, I'm very excited for Gagey Barboza next week in the super violence fight. Uh, very excited to see if Gagey can tactically figure out Barbosa because if he tries to strike at range with him, it's going to be a bad situation. Um, I think if, we, if Gagey gets up to pressure, we're going to have a really fun fight. Yeah, uh, it can go either way. I'll make a prediction Barboza by a wheel kick or some other crazy kick. But I'll even I then, won't be surprised if the pressure of Gagey overwhelms him. I won't um, be surprised. How about I say Barbosa by leg kick, TKO? That's interesting because they're both leg kicks. Yeah, I think Barbosa. Gage by leg is kick one of his him. most technical aspects. A lot of people critique his technique, but one of the most technical things he does are are leg kicks. Um, hopefully, we'll get around to also covering probably my one of my favorite events of the year so far, one championship with the debut of Eddie Alvarez and the debut of Demetrius Johnson. Both of them are fighting two low key killers. Go look up those guys, Timofey, and uh, I think. I think I'm going to the little piranha, the Japanese star that uh, Demetrius is fighting is going to be a monster. And there's like three other title fights. Gary Tonin's also on that fight. Oh, yeah, but Gary Tonin's a prelim. They got uh, Ung La, the middleweight champion. They got, uh, or like, I don't know how the middleweight But he's one of the most interesting prospects for me, of so course. I just had to call him out. Gary Tonin's fight is going to be huge. 
They have like three title fights happening. It's a monster event. Yeah, he's fighting a Muay Thai killer. And too. I think it might even be on uh, TNT or Bleacher Report VR Live. So really awesome to check that one out. And tons of great uh, Muay Thai fights and kickboxing fights happening on that card, as well as obviously KG Barbosa and that event happening. There are stuff to catch up on the NCAA wrestling championships that just yeah. happened. We'll probably have some stuff for you guys for that. In the midst of it, there was a quick beef that we can mention between Bo Nickel and Ben Askren. Bo oh, Nickel man. called Ben Askren yeah. out, and the head of Flow said he'll pay for them to have a wrestling match. That's some Hodge level wrestling. I'd love to see it. I don't know if uh, it'd be great. I hope it's folk style or freestyle. I don't know. But, be but Ben has said because Dylan Dennis tried to call him out for a jiu-jitsu match. He said he's not focusing on grappling right now. He's focusing just on MMA. But As maybe should. after he retires, he'd be open to these st types of matches. Maybe a CJJ, maybe a jiu-jitsu match right. with Dennis, maybe a folk or a freestyling yeah. with um, Just an exhibition of some kind yeah. would be fun. Um, but for now, I think that's great. Yeah, the one last thing I wanted to say, just because we're always throwing it in, I know I probably said the word left way a million times, it's because I want to see a left way MMA promotion, and I do believe Rogan and Bravo are going to make it one day. I have faith, I have hope, but I saw... We're going to speak it to existence. For real, for real. <laughs> I saw a great KO this week just on highlights. They were clinch fighting. We talked a lot about the clinch today, and throughout the clinch, there were punches and elbows and everything thrown, but the one fighter headbutted the other in the chin. We and, love that. And, Legalize yeah. it. Legalize and he knocked him out, bro. Yeah. He knocked him Legalize out. It. Precision headbutting. Yeah. See you next week.